the Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Matthew. Glory to you, o Lord. After the wise men had left, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, Get up, take the child and his mother, and flee to Egypt, and remain there until I tell you. For Herod is about to search for the child to destroy him. Then Joseph got up, took the child and his mother by night, and went to Egypt, and remained there until the death of Herod. This was to fulfill what had been spoken by the Lord through the prophets. Out of Egypt I have called my son. When Herod died, an angel of the Lord suddenly appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt and said, Get up, take the child and his mother, and go to the land of Israel, for those who were seeking the child's life are dead. Then Joseph got up, took the child and his mother, and went to the land of Israel. But we had heard that Archelaus was ruling over Judea in place of his father Herod. He was afraid to go there. And after being warned in a dream, he went away to the district of Galilee. There he made his home in a town called Nazareth, so that what had been spoken through the prophets might be fulfilled. He will be called a Nazarene. The Gospel of the Lord. Paul writes to the Ephesians, he destined us for adoption as his children through Jesus Christ, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace that he freely bestowed on us in the beloved. Outside the ancient city of Ephesus was one of the great seven wonders of the ancient world. It was the temple to the goddess Artemis. According to the Greek historian Plutarch, the original temple burned down on the same day that Alexander the Great was born. And when he was older, Alexander offered to pay for a new temple. But the Ephesians refused. They said they would do it themselves. It took them 120 years and the new temple was awe-inspiring. In the first century, around the time when the Gospels were written, the Roman natural philosopher Pliny the Elder described the temple as the most wonderful monument of Greek magnificence and one that merits our genuine admiration. It was 425 feet long, and there were 127 columns each of them 60 feet high. Its roof was made of cedar. The statue of the goddess herself was carved out of ebony. And in first century artwork, we can see that Artemis of Ephesus has her arms outstretched with long bracelets hanging down from her wrists. She has animals carved into her skirt, symbols of the zodiac on her neck to convey her sense of her cosmic power. As a wealthy goddess, Artemis possessed a large portion of the land around Ephesus, including lakes and vineyards, pastures and herds of animals. The whole temple complex was meant to impress. And no wonder, as Luke tells us in the book of Acts, that when Paul tried to preach the gospel in Ephesus, a riot broke out. Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. That is what the crowd kept shouting to overpower the message of the gospel. Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. So when Paul writes this letter to the churches of Asia Minor, he is writing to a region where many are fiercely loyal to the pagan religion. He needs to be able to translate the gospel into a thought pattern that is not only comprehensible, but also compelling. How does he do this? Well, we know that Paul, we think Paul was writing from Rome. He was in prison. It was 62 AD, the reign of the emperor Nero. He is older now, less fiery and polemical, 
And this is reflected in the style of his letter, which is so different from all of his early letters. This letter is full of prayers, extraordinary hymns of blessing, and his style is liturgical, repetitive, highly mannered. This is likely the last letter he wrote before his execution. One of the most famous blessings begins in chapter 1, verse 3, which we heard in the epistle reading. It begins, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And this blessing runs for 11 verses and is a single sentence. 27 lines of Greek text, all one sentence. This outburst of praise is so extraordinary that the great German classic scholar, Edward Norden, noted that these verses in Ephesians were, quote, the most monstrous sentence conglomeration that I have ever encountered in Greek. And when he was just 30 years old, Norden wrote a book on Greek and Latin prose style published more than 100 years ago that is still being used today. So his judgment carries weight. And in this monstrous sentence conglomeration, we notice that Paul does something very interesting. He renames Jesus. He writes, he destined us for adoption as his children through Jesus Christ, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace that he freely bestowed on us in the beloved. Paul identifies Jesus as the beloved. In the Greek translation of the Old Testament, this word beloved translates two different Hebrew words. One is a pet name for God, a pet name that God gives to the chosen people of Israel or their representatives. It is a term of intimate affection, like darling. And the other Hebrew word means only, as an only son. And so these two words, darling and only son, are translated by the same Greek word, beloved. And so when we go to the New Testament and we see in the baptism of Jesus, as he is coming out of the water, God says, this is my son, the beloved, with whom I am well pleased. Thus the Hebrew notions of intimacy and being the only son are combined in the person of Jesus. Jesus has a uniquely close relationship to God. Jesus is the only son. He is the beloved. And so here is our answer. By renaming Jesus as the beloved, Paul is showing the churches in Asia Minor, and he is reminding us today that being a follower of Jesus has a specific concrete meaning. It means that we are in Christ. And if we are in Christ, then the way God regards Jesus is now how God regards us. In Christ, we too become the beloved of God. That is our new identity. This has a challenging implication for our lives. It is really easy to forget our identity as beloved. When I taught incarcerated men at Sing Sing and Fishkill Correctional Facilities, the first thing the men would often do is write uh, after their names on their papers their prisoner number. And I once asked them why they did this, because it wasn't something I'd asked them to do. I didn't actually realize they all had individual numbers. Oh, said one of the men, that's just automatic for us. That is how we are known by the system. We are so used to writing it for everything that we just do it. We become identified with that number. And so in the culture of prison, my students had, in a way, lost their identity. They had become a number. And this loss of identity can happen on a larger historical scale. At the age of 38, just after a few years of publishing his massive book on Greek and Latin prose style, Edward Norton was appointed to the Latin chair at the University of Berlin, the very top of his profession. It was a remarkable rise for a remarkable scholar. But when the Nazi party gained power in Germany in the early 1930s, Edward Norton was given a new identity. Even though he had been baptized in the evangelical church at age 17, even though the president of Harvard at one time had called him the most famous Latinist in the entire world, Norton's family background meant the Nazi regime could only see him in one way. They gave him a new identity, Jew. 
He lost the Latin chair at the University of Berlin. He was not allowed to teach or publish books. Because of the so-called Jewish tax, he was forced to sell his home and his library. It was only with the help of friends that he was able to escape to Switzerland, where he died. It is easy to lose our identity as the beloved, but maybe it's even easier to forget that our enemies are also the beloved of God. Our enemies, the ones we think are maybe impure or imperfect somehow or less intelligent than we are or hold the wrong political beliefs or dare I say, have a different vaccination status. In Christ, all of them, even our COVID enemies, the unmasked and the unvaccinated, they too have been adopted as children of God. In Christ, they too are beloved. Just a few days ago, we celebrated the birth of a baby. There was no great wealth, no great power, no great respectability in the scene at the manger in Bethlehem. Rather, God entered our world as a helpless, poor, vulnerable baby. The word made flesh, our flesh. And against today's secular pagan world, that would have us worship at its contemporary temples built to its gods. And against the disciples of that secular pagan world who shout at us to overpower the message of the gospel. Great is the God of social media or science or politics or unfettered consumerism or technology. And against a pagan world that would identify us as Jew or Greek, slave or free, rich or poor, vaccinated or unvaccinated, boosted or unboosted. That baby born in a manger reminds us that in Christ, we are all beloved.